All right, I think we'll uh, we'll start. Uh, for joining us today uh, for this webinar titled uh, Finance and Investment in the COVID-19 World. Uh, my name is Nadeem Mian. I'm the Portfolio Manager for Sharia Portfolio Canada. And, um, you know, we're based out of our GTA office. And with us today, uh, is, our, is a guest speaker, is Javeria uh, Hissim. Uh, she is a CPA who runs uh, her accounting practice, uh, J Mac, uh, in downtown Toronto. Um, so on the agenda today, she, you know, she will, inshallah, be uh, presenting and giving some insight as far as how to, uh, some valuable information on um, how to navigate through this COVID-19 environment. Uh, for specifically, you know, for business owners and other professionals alike, um, you know, that hopefully uh, she will uh, provide us, like I said, some valuable information. Uh, after that, um, I will be sharing my thoughts on the uh, investment environment and the outlook, uh, you know, specific to the markets and, and everything else and some of the investment themes that we're looking at here at Share Your Portfolio. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we will conclude with a healthy Q&A. Um, I believe you can also submit your you, you can submit your uh, uh, questions online via via the uh, Q and A tab. Um, so uh, with that, I will kind of begin and introduce uh, our guest speaker for today. Uh, Sister Javeria is a um, is a, not only a, a uh, accomplished uh, um, CPA. Uh, she's al she also is an, a very active community uh, member. Uh, in the Muslim community here at Churchill Meadows in Mississauga, uh, also known as the greatest neighborhood in uh, Canada. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Sister Javeria um, and, uh, you know, inshallah, uh, take it from there. Um, thank you, Nadeem. Uh, welcome, everyone. And I hope all of you are keeping well and are looking forward to the life after lockdown. Um, as we embrace this new normal, we have to remain careful and vigilant, and that's true not just for our health and our social interactions, but also about the operational and financial dynamics of our businesses. With this, let's get started. Let me pull out my presentation. Now, here we are. So um, as we navigate the world in which COVID-19 exists and it's going to be there for a while, it's critical that we are able to adapt and transform our businesses. Our mindset of surviving from day to day is not just going to help. And after today's presentation, I hope that you will have relevant and up-to-date financial guidance that you can apply to your organization. Let's take a look at, the, at what the crisis has meant for the Canadian economy. Since the lockdown started in mid-March, physical distancing measures and closure of businesses brought a large portion of the economy to a standstill. As we can see from the latest statistics, the toll has been heavy. Manufacturing sales declined by 9.2% in March as 17 out of 21 industries reported reduction in sales. And uh, this marked the largest monthly decline in over a decade. So that's something to say. Similarly, wholesale sales reduced by 2.2% in March. Uh, the results were varied across the subsectors, while the motor vehicle subsector was the worst hit and contributed the most to the decline in sales. The food and beverage subsector posted its largest growth rate, rate on record. If nothing else, uh, this shows that there cannot be a one size fits all approach in dealing with the economic crisis. And you as an entrepreneur must be cognizant of your operational and financial reality. With the economy being largely shut down by in April, Canada lost nearly 2 million jobs. And this is the largest monthly decline ever and pushed the unemployment rate to 13%. Job losses, as expected, were steepest in the retail sector, given that many retailers were closed across the country. Uh, this is a bleak situation, but the good news is that it's expected the worst is over, and the labor market will slowly recover as the economy reopens in May. Another factor that weighed in uh, towards a uh, more brighter future is that the, econ the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or SERB as it's commonly known, uh, proved to be a good income resource and a good income support for workers who had lost jobs. SERP was launched by the government uh, in early April 
And by May 14th, over 13.7 million SERB applications have been processed. In fact, credit must be given to the federal and provincial governments that introduced a range of relief measures to lessen the economic woes of businesses and individuals. Uh, most of these measures have either been automatic or, as we can see in the case of Canada Emergency Business Account, they have been provided in the least amount of processing time. Of course, this helped in improving to some extent the liquidity for businesses and consumers in this economic crisis. Now, uh, with, with the easing of uh, the restrictions across Canada, we can hope to see some, uh, some uh, improvement in the economy. And as we can see that with the exception of Nunavut, all provinces and territories have announced how businesses, professional and medical services and personal services will reopen and they have started rolling out these plans. Uh, as this is happening, we all uh, are realizing that, the, that this will not be business as usual. We will not be resuming the way we have operated in a pre-COVID world. So if this is the new reality, is our business ready for it? That's the question that we do need to ponder over. Now, uh, in, in, in this new world, in this new reality, your success will depend on being proactive in assessing your risks having plans to deal with the challenges and capitalize on opportunities, having a structure that is nimble and allows you to adapt quickly to change. And I'm not just throwing off some buzzwords here. These are characteristics that you can build into your organization, regardless of the size, regardless of the nature of your work. And what I would like to emphasize is that this holds true as much for professionals as for other businesses. Um, unfortunately, the tendency that I'm seeing among professionals is that they are focusing on how to resume their operations with some tweaks, uh, but they're not taking a holistic view of the situation. So this, this needs to be taken care of. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, the first and um, I would say the most critical step in, in getting your business financially prepared for a COVID-19 reality is to analyze the drivers affecting your business. Uh, this could be changing consumer behavior and spending habits. Uh, you need to see, have you benefited from the surge in consumer interest in your product? Or unfortunately, are you, are you, do you have a product that people will, can no longer afford to buy or uh, that perhaps is the last one to be reopened by the government? Similarly, what are the internal factors affecting your business? Uh, do you have high fixed costs or maybe you signed up a contract for renovation right before the crisis hit? Um, you also need to consider if the new ways of doing business means changing a skill set among your workforce or a need for automating your processes. So once you have a clear view of what are the main factors affecting your business, you need to analyze your current liquidity position as well as how the drivers affecting your business impact your cash flows. So let me, let me try and clarify it a bit more. For example, in the case of renovation project uh, that you had signed up right before the crisis started, you need to analyze what would be the cost of going ahead and completing the project, as well as what would be the costs of terminating the contract altogether. So you need to carefully evaluate the impact of each business driver on your cash flow. And again, this must be an exhaustive exercise so that your plans have a sound footing. Now, this exercise will, will help you to update your strategic plan. And uh, that could help you to deal with your particular situation. For example, uh, if you find yourself with, uh, with a high liquidity, but also a high risk to your cash flows, then your strategy may be focused on monitoring and prioritizing your costs and reassessing your product portfolio so that your efforts and your finances are focused on those avenues that are aligned with the business drivers. Uh, you need to develop a range of scenarios and clearly identify the assumptions behind each scenario as you develop your financial models. Uh, the range across these scenarios will tie in with the risk assessment that you had done. For instance, if you're in the hospitality sector and it has been, of course, hardly hit by the crisis, you may come up with, with many varying scenarios. Uh, once you have built a detailed financial plan around the scenario, then the cash flow forecast will help you identify if there are any gaps in the financing that you should plug in. 
you need to ensure that you have adequate liquidity to pursue the strategy that you have identified for your business. And in this regard, uh, CIBA or the Canada Emergency Benefit Account, uh, business account, sorry, is, is a useful financing arrangement that provides guaranteed interest-free loan of 40,000 to small businesses and NFPs. If you are able to pay off the loan by December 2022, 25% of the outstanding balance will be forgiven by the government. In case you are unable to pay off the loan by December 22, the balance will be converted into a three-year term loan at 5% interest rate and will be repayable by 25. So if you have not already applied for SIBA, it's definitely worth looking into. You do not have to show how COVID-19 has affected your business. You may not have been negatively affected at all, uh, for now, the eligibility criteria requires that you should have paid total salary of $20,000 to $1.5 million in 2019. And you should have a business account with a financial institution you're dealing with. However, recently the Prime Minister has uh, announced that the eligibility for, for CBA will be expanded and it will include sole proprietors who do not have uh, salary. Uh, to show for. Uh, it would also include businesses that have been relying on contractors and family-owned businesses where employees might have been paid through dividends. So these changes are yet to be incorporated in the application process for SIVA and if you're an, an entrepreneur that uh, falls within the expanded eligibility criteria, you should reach out to your financial institution and ex explore this. Uh, SIBA does not happen to be the only financing arrangement that's out there. Besides SIBA, the government has rolled out other credit programs that target small businesses. You can apply for term loans or you can ask your financial institution for specific relief, for example, interest-only payments on your loan. Uh, you can even explore sector-specific funding. For example, the government is rolling out funding to tech startups or agricultural uh, organization. So these are, you know, things that you need to look into. The credit programs are out there. That's, that's not the issue. The issue is that what you need to do as a business owner, as a professional, is to have a financial plan uh, that can help identify what is your financing requirement. You do not need to take on too much loan uh, that push your servicing cost to the roof. But at the same time, you, you do need to have adequate financing so that you are not in a situation where, where you do not have sufficient funds to roll out the strategy that you had or the business model that you had wanted to pursue. Cash management is and will continue to be an area of focus for businesses. So please get ready to put some serious thought into your financial planning. Besides cash, what else could be important? Of course, bringing your employees back to work and Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy can help you substantially reduce the costs of doing so. The catch is that you must be able to prove that your revenue has declined by at least 15% in March and 30% in April or May. Uh, the government has recently extended the program until August 29th and the details about the eligibility criteria over the extended period are yet to be announced. But if you want to you know, uh, claim it for the ongoing period or for the retroactive period, uh, we, we do have the revenue thresholds. So what can the 75% subsidy do for you? Well, as the name implies, of course, it covers 75% of payroll cost for employees with a per employee cap of $847 a week. Uh, if you previously hired an employee, let's say at $1,000 a week, but you had to lay him or her off as your business was shut down, you can now bring him back to work and claim $750 from the government. Uh, you will pay the $250 from the business, but let's say your cash flow is tight and your employee is agreeable to working at $750 a week, then you can claim the entire $750 as subsidy from the government and have zero cost to your business. Moreover, if the employee has been hired but has not been given any work, uh, that is he's on leave with pay, you can claim 100% refund of the employee contributions that are part of the payroll tax remittance. The 75% subsidy can be claimed for uh, an employee hired retroactively. So that means that you know you, you want to hire someone from March 15, but you will be paying him now 
that's possible under this program. It can even be claimed for new employees who had not been, who were not working with you in the pre-crisis. Uh, but in case of shareholder employees and their family members who are, uh, who are employees of the business, wage subsidy can only be claimed as long as they had been paid pre-crisis salary. So they should have been on the payroll of the corporation before March 15th. A word of caution, Canada emergency wage subsidy rules are complex and they are detailed. So if you put in, in an incorrect claim uh, and it's, it's not according to the regulations, you may end up repaying the wage subsidy. Worst, if you put in a fraudulent claim, such as manipulating the revenue to meet the eligibility criteria, they could be having fines and penalties. So be careful about that. Um, in addition to the, to the 75% subsidy, there is also a 10% wage subsidy available for employers. And uh, here you do not have to show how your business has been affected by COVID-19. You can claim the subsidy as long as you are one of these employers. And most of these employers are also eligible for 75% subsidy that we talked about earlier, with one major exception. Uh, the 10% subsidy is only available to small corporations, the CCPCs, that are entitled to small business deductions. Uh, another difference from the 75% subsidy is that if an employer was shut down, it cannot make a retroactive claim for the 10% subsidy. Uh, if you did not pay an employee in a previous period, the 10% subsidy is lost. For the, those employers that are eligible for both the 75% subsidy and the 10% subsidy, the total benefit cannot exceed 75%. So the way I see it is that you may be interested in applying for the 10% subsidy if you are not eligible for the 75% subsidy, or if you want an immediate cash relief, since uh, this, this, the 10% subsidy reduces your payroll tax remittance to CRA and gives you an immediate uh, cash savings. Finally, uh, let's look at some of the other government benefits and incentives. Businesses have been allowed deferral of their income tax and HST. Uh, you must manage your cash flow so that you're in a position to pay off these liabilities as they become due. Uh, another area that the government has worked on is to provide rent relief to small businesses that have experienced at least 70% decline in revenue. The relief is available through landlords uh, applying for a forgivable loan that will cover 50% of the rent payable by small businesses. While the government will, will chip in 50% of the rent, uh, the landlords are expected to absorb 25% of the cost and small businesses are required to pay the remaining 25%. The applications for the rent assistance will start uh, on May 25th through the CMSC website. So if you qualify as a small business for the rent assistance, it's a good idea to speak to your landlord about this relief. And now, finally, uh, I would like to wrap up my discussion of government incentives with a brief overview of how SERP can be claimed by small business owners. This is a relief I would say that almost all Canadians are well aware of, they're well familiar with, but there has not been a lot of discussion on how small business owners can claim it. So the way it works is that if you're a sole proprietor, uh, SERP entitlement depends on net income before tax. If you have been drawing salary from your corporation, it depends on your gross salary. And this benefit has been the only one until now that recognized dividends as a mean of remuneration for a small business owner. Uh, SERP gives immediate cash relief for individuals who meet the eligibility criteria, but if you have a small business that qualifies for other government reliefs, particularly the 75% paid subsidy, it may be worthwhile to see which of the two will be beneficial in, in your case. And in most cases, from, from my experience, it has been the 75% wage subsidy, even if it means repaying the SERP payments that you may have already received. So uh, with this, we are at the end of my presentation. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions. I can look up the chat. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Sister Javeria. Um, and we're gonna, you, you can uh, actually um, post your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we're gonna kind of take the next segment and I'm gonna uh, go to my presentation quickly. And uh, one second here, let me just share my screen. Um, 
Okay, so um, I will be speaking uh, basically uh, talking about markets and whatnot, but before I do that, uh, let me just uh, begin by uh, introducing uh, Share Your Portfolio. For those of you uh, who aren't familiar with uh, uh, Share Your Portfolio, one second here. Everyone can see my screen. Okay. Hold on. All right. So um, Share Your Portfolio is uh, <clears throat> the, the parent company, for those of you who are new to the firm or have, haven't heard us, um, we are a fully registered uh, portfolio and asset management firm in, in Canada. Uh, we are discretionary portfolio managers, so what that means is that uh, we are active investors and our, our role really is, our mission is to help uh, you know, Muslim Canadians fulfill their financial objectives while making sure that the investments uh, that they are into our Sharia compliant. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the firm itself has, uh, has had this history, you know, starting back in the U.S. for about uh, over 16 years. And Alhamdulillah, you know, we, we've uh, ventured off into Canada and uh, we got our registration with the OSC and the BCSC uh, just at the start of the year. So my role is uh, obviously as the portfolio manager is to uh, you know do a lot of the financial advising and at the same time uh, overlook the the uh, the portfolios and the markets and whatnot. So um, you know so diving into this, uh, what I'm going to do is start my presentation by um, focusing on a couple of things here. First off, this is just a quick disclaimer to uh, you know make sure that uh, we're following all the rules and uh, whatnot. Um, so first off, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to give a brief summary as far as looking in the rear view mirror, uh, as far as what's happened uh, to the economy and at the same time, more importantly, what's happened to the markets and, and you know, our investments and so forth. And then subsequently, uh, just kind of look at some of the questions uh, th that uh, we're getting from clients and hopefully provide an outlook with some uh, investment themes going forward and what we've been doing for our clients and, and how we've been positioning. So. Since 2020 has been a very fun year, why not uh, revisit some of the stuff that's happened? Uh, obviously, the COVID-19 shutdown, this, is, this has been a policy choice and not an economic imbalance. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, previously when you take a look at what's happened in say in 2008 or the tech bubble or any other really kind of, um, you know, recession or bear market in, in, in the history of, of uh, the stock market, uh, it's it's happened because either there's a real estate bubble, the central banks have kind of miscalculated on interest rate. There's other economic threats like inflation and so forth. This is more of a of a of a decision to shut the economy down. So it is very unique, and that's why I think we we'll, we'll, we will be getting a different type of contraction in Q2 and Q3. We're already starting to see some of that. Um, like, for example, the U.S. GDP came out recently and uh, it was down about f uh, almost 5%. Uh, Canadian GDP I, is due out actually later on this month. Uh, but, you know, the numbers are pretty horrible. Uh, what that simply means is that the economy shrunk in the first quarter uh, and we'll probably be getting more, uh, you know, bad news kind of going forward. Um, and, you know, what that has resulted and, you know, Sister Javeri kind of highlighted some of that was that, you know, we, we do have uh, really a ridiculous unemployment rate. Uh, where in the Canada, it's about 13%. That's the posted rate. In, in the U.S., uh, it's about 14, uh, close to 15%. Uh, and that, those are just some of the posted rates. We would, it's not even accounting some of the people that have uh, are working reduced hours or so forth, right? So, you know, all in all, this has resulted with the markets really kind of uh, uh, having this uh, steep, decline in really four weeks down about 30 percent whether you were in uh, Canada US both markets kind of felt that and it, it, the, the drop was pretty unprecedented uh, you, you don't we don't really get um, you know markets reacting this way uh, uh, you know but again it was an exceptional exceptional period and, and circumstance uh, this has resulted in in companies uh, with their earnings uh, kind of uh, dropping. Um, we've also seen in a headline such as oil crashing, you know, trading negative futures. What does that mean? Gold uh, has actually risen and, and typically gold has been one of the safe haven assets. People will tend to invest money in gold when there's uncertain times. Uh, so we've seen some of this. This is kind of what's been playing, what has been played out in 2020. 
Uh, however, I'll end with, you know, just the quick uh, thing is, and again, it, it, it goes into, it summarizes what uh, Sister Javeria has kind of said is that, you know, governments and central banks across the world, obviously, you know, she was speaking specific to Canada, but even across the world, the response has been very swift and, and unprecedented. And, and I think that's very important, um, you know, for our outlook and going forward. So, um, you know, looking ahead and, you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of begin by raising the questions because at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's about questions, you know, and, and, and hopefully we can uh, either answer them or shed some light on them and, and at the same time kind of discuss, you know, some of the strategies and, and what we've been doing to, to kind of navigate this market. So, you know, questions that we get, for example, are, uh, are we going to enter into depression or recession? You know, is this with the unemployment rate being so high, you know, it hasn't been this high since, you know, 1940 or 30, whatever, we've heard that, uh, is the recovery of V, U, or L shape. And for those of you who might not understand what that means, a V is kind of like the letter V, quick, uh, you know, it went down, went back up. U tends to be a little bit more, okay, went down. There's a, there's a period of kind of uh, a, a prolonged nothingness or, or just going sideways and then ultimately, you know, things start to pick up, uh, you know, much later. And an L shape is where you really have a prolonged period of uh, economic stagnation or, or just uh, no growth. And I, I think the only, I mean, one of the more ex better examples of that would be what happened to Japan, I think probably in the uh, 1980s uh, um, and 90s, where they just had a period of, of stagnant growth. Um, and other questions, of course, you know, markets being what they are, um, do we retest the lows? And that's just a fancy way of saying we hit a bottom, uh, and we'll see this in the later slides, we hit a bottom, you know, in mid, in mid to late March, uh, we bounced off it, are we going to head back to, you know, are we going to test, go back to those lows or even worse, break them and go even further? And then finally, uh, well, not finally, but of course, point number four, but this is actually probably the most important thing, is COVID-19, vaccine reopenings. There are all sorts of questions as far as, uh, you know, what, you know, what's going to happen with this and, and how is the economy going to react to reopenings and, you know, is it going to get back to, um, you know, 80%, 60%, things of that sort, right? So, so, and last but not least, I'm going to end with the presentation by just giving our thoughts as far as what we think is a good strategy in this marketplace, how we believe that, you know, investments uh, uh, should be allocated and placed and uh, at the same time go specifically into certain themes that we think are, are going to be beneficial to uh, in investors. So first off, uh, the investment outlook, and I'll begin by saying this, is that markets bottom before the data bottoms. And that simply means that, you know, the market is, is always looking forward. Uh, it, it is uh, not necessarily, you know, trading on today's headlines. And so, you know, and, and, the, and the next three points are going to kind of speak to that. Uh, like, first of all, COVID, like we, we get those beepers on our phone every single day, you know, as far as the cases, the deaths, and where we on on the bell curve, right? And, you know, in general, what we are starting to see is that we are currently either, you know, at, or in some cases, maybe even on the other side of the mountain, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the COVID curve. Uh, you know, we're starting to see signs of that, for example, in New York, which obviously has been hard, uh, uh, heavy hit, um, that, you know, the, the number of cases growth has kind of slowed down. In Canada, you know, we've seen some pretty good numbers out of BC. Uh, Ontario also, you know, we're, it looks like we're kind of in the, in the peak stages of, of, of the curve. Um, you know, so the market is more interested on ahead, not again, not on the current environment. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to COVID? Um, the second thing obviously is, you know, the whole shutdown has had an impact on the economy and the growth of the economy. So the GDP is essentially the, uh, the, the benchmark or, or the number that really focuses on, you know, what's going on is economy going or shrinking, right? And, and the GDP essentially defines, are we on a, in a recession or not? So number one, yeah, we are in a recession, uh, technically. I mean, uh, it's, you know, that's not uh, definitely, that's not something that is a, a hard question to answer. Um, but what we also realize is that, uh, you know, market, stock markets can continue to go higher even as GDP is sitting at negative growth. And that, that was actually the case in 2009 where we saw multiple quarters of the economy actually shrinking, but the markets were in advance looking ahead and, and you know, 
trending on the upside. Um, jobless claims, of course, we talked about that, uh, how the, the number of jobs out there has, uh, uh, has been uh, catastrophic. Um, now, having said that, you know, this is kind of like a situation where, you know, you're a, ho you're a patient in a hospital and obviously you've been in ICU and the first thing that they want to see is uh, a, a kind of the stop the bleeding, so to speak. And, and what we're starting to see is uh, the, the number of job growth is starting to, the number of people, uh, uh, you know, claiming joblessness is starting to slow down. So that it's a weird way of kind of thinking about it, but uh, but ultimately the market is that bleeding looks like it's going to stop. Um, so those are kind of three things that, like I said, the market is is definitely uh, looking in at. Um, you know, obviously the the government and the central bank actions have been swift and unprecedented. Uh, the, the reason why I see depression is unlikely is because the last time the world had a depression was in 1930. And, you know, at that time, it only came about three years after. And, and even the, um, when we had the financial uh, credit crisis uh, in 2008, the, the really, the government took, uh, it was a few months after uh, where they really took some substantial steps. So this has been a little bit, I think from a, from a timing perspective and even from the size of, of what they've done is truly remarkable that they reacted immediately. And I think that's important for the market. Um, and, you know, our view is that, you know, have, because of that, we're, we're unlikely to, to retest the lows. Uh, again, this is our view. It, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's something that we're kind of making a call on. Um, because right now, like I said, I think the, the, what the government and, is doing is, is very important. And they've also said that uh, they will continue to do more as time goes on. Um, having said that, you know, there are some lingering and we think permanent uh, effects uh, as far as what's happened in, in this in, in this uh, period that will lead to long lasting changes, uh, you know, going forward. So, so our job is to kind of, you know, uh, pick and choose on on what that means. Not pick and choose, actually. Pick and choose some of the areas of where we think will uh, will do well in this environment. Uh, but more importantly, what we've learned in the past is, you know, whether you had a period like a tech bubble or whether you had a, in the financial crisis, is when you get those types of of events, uh, it, it does it, it is a type of a reset. And so what we've noticed, for example, is, uh, you know, there are some companies that uh, you know don't come back. Uh, there's there's some certain sectors that take much longer to recuperate uh, than than others. So that's going to happen. There's going to be some industries that are going to continue to feel the pain, but there are other industries out there that we think will come back faster and probably thrive uh, thrive in a post COVID environment. Um, so that's why our view is that we, we do think that we will probably get uh, an economic recovery in the first half of two, uh, 2021. Um, and overall, generally speaking, we are more bullish on the US versus Canada. And, and the reason for that is quite frankly, is that the, the from, a, from a stock market perspective, uh, the uh, US stock market is much more diversified in terms of sectors than the Canadian market. Um, and so as a result, you know, we are uh, more bullish on, on that. Um, so when it comes to investment strategy and, and how we essentially manage clients' money, we, we, we do what's called a core satellite strategy. And, you know, first off, we do feel that active investing will make a comeback. And what that means is, you know, there's over the last 10 years, especially after the um, credit crisis, uh, there was this big shift to uh, passive investments, ETFs. Uh, and, and, you know, it was a question of basically, you know what, I, I got the cheapest fee for my ETF and, and, you, and you did well. Uh, we think right now with this, with this kind of uh, activity, I think, it will pay to, you know, be in areas of the market that are working well and, and stay away from those that are not. And so what the core satellite strategy really does is it, it tries to take uh, uh, the best of both worlds in the sense that when we build our portfolios, we, we start off by a, a using a core uh, investment. And these typically include uh, exchange traded funds, ETFs. And that allows us to get market access. It gives, it gives us a, a lower cost option. It, it it does do what indexes, uh, you know, are 
are, are designed to do, which is low cost market exposure, diversified and all that uh, other good stuff. Um, now the satellite is what we do in the sense that this is where we're trying to uh, use some of our investment themes and try to outperform the market. Uh, there's a little bit more management that goes into something like this, which is why uh, there is a higher cost. And uh, at the same time, what I will say is, uh, you know, we do, at times we will be able to capitalize on short-term themes, but at the same time, you know, we are a little bit more focused on long-term uh, cyclical uh, areas that we want to be invested into. So this is kind of a combination of the two where we build portfolios that number one, uh, have a core, but at the same time have a different component that can hopefully, uh, you know, ex capitalize on those investment themes that we think uh, will will, uh, will do better going forward. Um, so some of those investment themes, what are they? Uh, you know, we are, like I said, we're, we're positioning for the present and the post COVID-19 uh, era. And really what we're trying to do is of course, there are a lot of questions out there. You know, what happens when COVID are we out of the woods? Are we not out of the woods, right? So we obviously have to kind of uh, ho hope for the best, but at the same time, maybe even plan, you know, just in case things don't go right. And so, you know, having said that, we think that uh, some of the changes that have happened in this market have kind of expedited this. So what I mean by that is, there was, for example, this shift, uh, this sh uh, shift towards cloud and video streaming and some of the e-commerce, uh, you know, business. What, what COVID has kind of done is, is um, accelerated that trend. And we think that trend is here to stay. And we do feel that, uh, you know, whether we get, whether we're out of the woods or not, or continue to maybe go back into the woods on this COVID thing, uh, you know, those sectors will continue to do well. And, um, you know, we're starting to see that, uh, uh, you know, the work from home is, is real. Uh, there's a lot of obviously news coming out that, you know, companies are, are deciding that uh, half of their workforce is going to come back, or in some cases, none of their, uh, none of their workforce is going to come back, uh, you know, into the regular offices, and instead they're going to be gravitating more towards the work from home. So all this kind of helps out in the cloud space, and it helps out, you know, also in video, like we're doing right now with Zoom, for example. Um, and likewise, you know, the, on the retailing side, uh, it's been, you know, we've seen a big massive shift uh, that was already happening, but it just kind of snowballed very aggressively with this uh, area. Uh, of course, healthcare is uh, an area that we're focused in on. Uh, it's on the top of our mind. And I, we, we think that uh, this will continue to be an area which will do well uh, in, in either good or bad markets. Um, consumer staples, this is just a fancy word of saying essentials. Uh, stuff that we need, um, you know, the toilet paper jokes, that's a consumer staple. Um, likewise, food and, and just basic necessities. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as we kind of go down the list, semiconductors, uh, we think that with the um, kind of the movement to cloud, to technology, uh, this will create more demand. Uh, you know, funny enough, uh, we own a, a, you know, we have, we own a chip company that uh, specializes in gaming and, and we've seen a, a big move in that. So these are kind of some of the themes where uh, are, are definitely in a secular growth trend. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, 5G, artificial intelligence uh, is just kind of snowball a little bit more. And last but not least, uh, the two other sectors, gold, we, we, we tend to uh, be bullish on, on gold, or I should say uh, we have gold in, in, I would say, almost all of our portfolio. We have an allocation towards it for the simple reason that, uh, you know, it, it has helped us out in volatile types of markets. But at the same time, we do think that the, uh, the factors, benefit, uh, you know, looking for gold ahead are favorable, um, you know, with all the stimulus and the money that's out there. Uh, you know, there is, gold does tend to be a, a safe haven at the same time. It, it also serves as kind of an alternative to currency, so to speak. And finally, last but not least, select dis consumer discretionary. Uh, yes, you know, when the economy comes back, uh, we feel that, you know, there are going to be certain uh, um, consumer discretionary sectors that will do better than others. And our job is to kind of figure that out and then figure out, okay, when people start spending money again uh, on, uh, on uh, you could say non-essentials, where are they likely to go? So these are just, you know, some of the themes that we're doing, we're looking at in our portfolios. And, um, you know, I'll kind of end it there. And so uh, at this point, I guess, you know, we'll um, invite any questions that you guys have. Um, 
So a second here. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll just quickly kind of you know take a few questions here, and, and please uh, we welcome uh, uh, you know questions uh, for this. So first question here is uh, any insight on how markets could uh, react if there is a second wave? Um, so you know again, I think if we do get that event. Uh, you know, kind of looking back, we will see that, you know, when markets kind of roll over that way, uh, you know, even the best house in a bad neighborhood kind of feels the brunt. And so, uh, you, you know, we might see uh, money coming into safe haven assets such as the US dollar, gold, um, you know, thing, assets of that uh, category, uh, even fixed income, we actually uh, use a Sukuk ETF for that. Um, and then subsequently, what ends up happening is once you get that wave and there's a recovery, um, those those companies that are fundamentally sound, uh, you know, are, are the ones that typically do well. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, at Sharia Portfolio, because we follow a Sharia compliant mandate, um, you know, one of the main things is that uh, we're, we're restricted from investing into companies that are that are over leveraged. And that's actually saved us. So when markets kind of do bad, or if there is a second wave, um, one thing that you know kind of helps us is the fact that we're not exposed to those over leveraged companies. And you know, as you can see, you know, when things get bad, the last thing that whether you're a person or whether you're a corporation, the last thing you want to do is be exposed to that uh, heavy debt. Um, I see here another question is: uh, Is pre-authorized contributions a good way to get into the market during a time like this? Um, absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there's no way to kind of pick a bottom, uh, you know, and people try to do that. I think some of the, the best way to, is, is to do that is just spread out your uh, contributions evenly. That way, uh, you're, you know, you're never investing at the high, you're, you, well, you'll invest at the high and you'll invest at the low, but when you're spreading it out like that, uh, it, it, from a risk standpoint, it's actually uh, one of the best things that you can do in terms of, you know, managing the volatility is, is spread your contributions out. And that way you're not, you know, putting, for example, worst case scenario, you put, you put a big lump sum at the top of the market, right? Uh, that, that can obviously not, you know, uh, look too good. Um, I have another question here is, how do you compare real estate investment with stock in COVID-19? Okay, well, that's a good, that's a good question. So the, the one thing about the stock market is that um, you're, you can watch it on a minute to minute, even a second to second basis. It, it, it really is kind of uh, grabbing the pulse of the investor, uh, you know, while you speak. And so it is immediate and it is reflective, uh, you know, as far as what's going on. And um, now, having said that, you know, that's the stock market. Um, when it comes to real estate, real estate can be a lagger. And what I mean by that is the, the effects of real estate might not be immediate, but eventually they might kind of take hold down the road. So, for example, the market is always looking forward. But with the real estate, what we've seen, for example, is, uh, you know, once the news kind of the COVID impact happened on all the economic numbers happen, um, the job losses and some of those, uh, something to that effect, people will, you know, put things off or better, even worse, what ends up happening is uh, the prices aren't as reflected immediately. It might take a while before the real estate market figures out, wait a sec, there are no buyers because the person who's going to buy all of a sudden lost their job. So guess what? I'm, I'm either A, going to take a lower bid or B, uh, I will, you know, take my house off the market, which again is not is not good for the real estate market. So, uh, you know, how do I how do you compare? Number one is is that is is the fact that uh, with stocks it's immediate, it's instant. With real estate, it does take a while to uh, for for prices to kind of you know affect. Um, okay, uh, question here is: uh, Do you have performance statistics for Sharia portfolio? Um, Yes, we can share, you know, some performance of, uh, like our U.S. portfolios have been in existence for, in some cases, you know, over 10, 15, even 15 years. So, though, again, those are the, the, the U.S. 
uh, models, the U.S. portfolios. Uh, the Canadian models have only been around basically for from 2020. So that is something that, yes, I, I can share with you, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the short-term performance of that. Uh, but, you know, we do sit on a portfolio management team and, and um, you know, the, uh, the U.S. portfolios and the Canadian portfolios, there's a, there's a lot of cross-pollination between the two. Um, you know, there's a lot of consistencies between the two. Like, for example, uh, we own uh, we own Facebook in, in in both in U.S. models and in Canadian models, and so there there are some similarities that maybe uh, you can take it, take with a grain of salt. Uh, that you can say, okay, well, you know, this is what the this is the track record of the U.S. Port, uh, U.S. models. So maybe you know it's somewhat reflected of what the Canadian model you know can potentially do. Uh, but again, from from a Canadian standpoint. We only have 2020 numbers, and uh, you know, if you send me an email uh, and you'd like some information on that, I, I'd be happy to uh, send that over to you. And I mean, were there any other questions either for myself or Sister Javeria? Um, I think uh, one second here. Let me just see if there's anything else. I think I think that's it. So unless there are so many other questions, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. And, um, you know, I'd like to also wish uh, everybody a pre-Eid Mubarak, uh, um, you know, as we kind of uh, uh, conclude these final days of Ramadan, inshallah. Uh, you know, uh, may Allah accept our prayers, our fast, and uh, inshallah, uh, you know, reward us with a nice Eid and uh, get rid of this uh, coronavirus uh, once and for all, inshallah. The Sister Juwaira has some final closing uh, remarks. Sure. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here. And uh, I hope I was able to add something to the knowledge of small businesses and professionals out there. Uh, as I said earlier, the biggest concern that I am seeing among my clients and um, in, in the you know the, the economy out there is uh, how to take care of your businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. So get out, get outside of that mentality of managing your business on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, think in terms of how to plan for your finances, and inshallah, uh, all will be better. Assalamu alaikum and Eid Mubarak from my end as well. Thank you. All right, guys. Assalamu alaikum. Eid Mubarak. And until next time, inshallah.